And finally, we've got uh, Melody Yashar. Uh, I don't know if she's in person or virtual. Uh, you're in person, hello. All right, take it away. Hi, everyone. The clicker's not working. No. She's filling it up, okay. That's fine. Uh, hi, I'm Melody. I am the Director of Building Design and Performance at ICON. ICON is a startup based out of Austin, Texas, and uh, we develop advanced construction technologies to advance humanity. I'm very fortunate to have to, to be working on both ICON's terrestrial construction projects as well as some of our work developing ISRU additive manufacturing solutions for space. Terrestrially, we focus on delivering accessible, dignified, and resilient uh, housing solutions to radically transform the course of uh, building with traditional means and methods. And in space, we focus on 100% ISRU regolith uh, construction, particularly deposition using directed energy uh, methods to create permanent infrastructure um, on the surface of the moon. Next slide. So our current project is uh, we refer to as Project Olympus, and this is our efforts to create a single construction system that can produce and additively manufacture a wide variety of civil engineering structures on the surface of the moon. Uh, interestingly, well, we support a project based out of Marshall Space Flight Center known as the Moon to Mars Planetary Autonomous Construction Technologies Project. That's a mouthful. And uh, interestingly, though, separate from that technology development effort, ICON has initiated a uh, prolonged sort of initiative to introduce architectural as well as master planning solutions for a uh, initial lunar base or lunar outpost. We've done this and we've begun that schematic uh, design effort in order to establish the technology and hardware requirements that we will need to create the infrastructure that is desired on the surface of the moon. So we lean into a kind of call and response between design of civic structures uh, to define technology and hardware requirements and then leveraging the constraints of the hardware to actually inform what we will build and what's possible to create in terms of civic infrastructure on the surface of the moon. Next slide, please. So we're working in collaboration with Marshall Space Flight Center on how we can demonstrate our uh, initial, our technology uh, within a proof of concept to validate one or more materials and processes in the next several years. Uh, and we're interested in advancing this uh, aboard the Eclipse mission, uh, and we'll be using the opportunity to mature the technology and demonstrate process viability for longer and more complex missions. So as I mentioned, the, we're supporting the Moon to Mars Planetary Autonomous Construction Technologies project based out of Marshall. We are one of three elements that are being developed for the impact project. Uh, ours is the construction hardware development, and the other two elements that are being developed at Marshall include uh, microwave sintering as well as material feedstock uh, delivery. Next slide, please. So there are two types of civil engineering structures, two regimes, so to speak, for the kind of construction that we want to be able to do on the moon. And those are horizontal construction, which will consist of uh, landing pads as well as roadways, so flat structures. And then eventually over time, once we've demonstrated capabilities for horizontal construction, uh, we'll move towards vertical construction, which includes uh, anything that's deposited in layers vertically, so to speak, that will that that consists of uh, berms, unpressurized structures of various types, and then eventually our uh, pressurized habitats. Next slide, please. So here is our current uh, thought for the form factor of the icon printer as it would be building on the moon. Uh, I'll speak in just a moment about some of our terrestrial efforts and the current form factor that we're working for our residential projects. Next slide, please. And uh, as, as 
it's our opinion, and, and I'm sure, not that I'm sure, it's the opinion of many of you here that 100% uh, ISRU processes, particularly having to do with surface construction with regoliths, will be an enabling uh, capability to ensure a permanent and sustained human presence on the moon. So this is why we're pursuing 100% ISRU regolith uh, construction processes. And uh, this slide is basically just to say that of, of the many surface activities and, uh, and capabilities that we will need to demonstrate on the surface of the moon for that sustained presence to become achievable. Next slide. An overwhelming majority of them will have to do with regolith, with regolith construction for the creation of permanent infrastructure and civil engineering structures. And so it's our opinion that by developing a single hardware construction system that we will be able to create a wide variety and range of uh, these structures with great versatility and on demand to respond to changing conditions and changing needs on the, sur on the lunar surface, but also importantly, to promote and ensure strategic expansion of an initial lunar base. Next slide. So this is uh, one of our uh, products of our initial master planning efforts and schematic design efforts to anticipate the types and range of structures that will be necessary for a uh, sustained lunar base. This uh, was, a, was a project that we began in collaboration with NASA as well as the BRK Ingalls group several years ago. And it's, uh, it's a master planning concept that we're continuing to develop today. Next slide, please. And here's our vision of what lunar landing pads may look like. We've begun to investigate and do some preliminary analysis and how these uh, landing pads will perform and uh, more on that soon in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, we all know that there, more likely than not, there will be multiple types of habitat units and modules that will be operational on the surface of the moon in advance of there being additively manufactured 3D printed structures. So we, to, in order to get there, we have to be thinking about how these types of structures will be able to interface with and leverage the technologies that will already exist on the moon, particularly when it comes to hard shell structures, perhaps even inflatable structures. And we'll have to meet multiple te regolith technology milestones to actually achieve what we consider to be the holy grail of human habitation on the surface of the moon and Mars, the creation of pressurized structures. So uh, we'll need to be integrating with how we excavate regolith, process regolith, um, and then include multiple, uh, let's say, means for ensuring a pressurized structure and uh, monitoring the structural health of those, of those structures as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so we uh, are, as, as I mentioned, not, not all of this can happen at all at once, right? This is going to take a long time and more likely than not, we'll, we'll need to develop a phase development approach for how strategic expansion of a lunar base is enabled. So uh, we see ourselves as being one part of that process. And uh, importantly, I think additive manufacturing being the kind of disruptive technology that it that it is within the within terrestrial construction, I really think that this is going to function similarly on the surface of the moon to enable, again, a wide range and type of civil, civil engineering structures. Next slide, please. Um, even in advance of ICON being awarded our initial SBIR, uh, we were invested and committed to identifying areas of technology co-development between the residential sector uh, for NASA for in-space construction and, and, uh, and, and manufacturing, as well as with the Air Force and DOD. So we really see the, our development on the residential front and for the work that we're doing for the DOD as adding value to uh, resolve some of the technology gaps that will inevitably come up for in-space construction. And uh, this uh, effort towards technology co-development is a key element and a key aspect of how we develop our work for both Earth and space. Next slide, please. 
We also realized that uh, in addition to having to need, needing to integrate with multiple technology capabilities on the surface of the moon, we have an opportunity to rethink the way that sustainable cities and communities are developed uh, in imagining the future of the lunar outpost and lunar base. And also we have a direct impact on how industry innovation and infrastructure will be developing uh, on the surface of the moon. And again, I really think that we should be looking towards to the earth and projects terrestrially to advance some of these technology gaps and identify some of the potential issues that we may be facing once we uh, realize these technologies and capabilities on the surface of the moon. So again, this idea of technology co-development is central to our work at ICON. Next slide, please. Uh, this is incredibly laggy, but now I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, I'll give you a brief introduction to some of the terrestrial work that ICON is, uh, is doing today as a sort of introduction and brief to, for, for those of you going to the 3D printed barracks tour this evening. Um, I'll start with our most current project. We're developing a 100 home community of 3D printed structures north of Austin in collaboration with the home builder Lennar. We currently have five printers deployed on site and uh, there will be more and uh, there should be an announcement for this pro more more information on this project released any day now uh, and this is north of Austin next slide please prior to that we had four uh, projects that we constructed again within Austin and this was our initial sort of uh, attempt to validate that 3D printing is indeed a construction technology that will be marketable and that can be sold on the residential market. So these are four homes, two of them being 900 square feet, two of them being 2000 square feet that uh, were sold almost instantaneously once they were put onto the market. Um, they were sold at market rate prices. And uh, yeah, they were each, uh, let's see, five days for the for the 900 square foot it took five days for the 900 square foot uh, houses to be constructed and eight days for the 2000 square foot houses to be constructed and that is only the 3d printed wall system i should say the houses were finished um, and the roofing was applied and all of the interior finishing was was done using traditional means and methods of construction next slide please so here's a view of, of the inside of those houses. They're actually available on Airbnb, some of them, if you would like to experience a 3D printed house. Next slide, please. Um, and back in 2021, we completed our first barracks project for the Texas Military Department. Uh, this was at Camp Swift, Texas. And at the time, this 3,800 square foot structure was the largest 3D printed structure in North America. We have since one-upped ourselves with the structure that you will be seeing this evening if you are on the tour. Next slide, please. Oh, and this is the interior of that barracks building. And uh, yes, we've since one upped ourselves in the structure that you'll be touring this evening at Fort Bliss is a 5,700 uh, square foot structure. And again, we've only printed the vertical walls, not the roofing. Uh, we, I'll discuss roofing in just a moment. Next slide, please. We've also done a couple of uh, technology demonstrations with uh, the Texas Military Department. Basically, in this case, we were printing a vehicle hide structure, which uh, they found to be incredibly valuable for uh, the creation of an on-demand sort of protective structure for vehicles. And uh, this was a, interestingly, this was a tilt up uh, way of constructing the vehicle hide. So we printed these uh, segments of the of the structure uh, horizontally on the ground and then tilted them up into place. Next slide. Prior to that, we completed a project in collaboration with the, with the uh, nonprofit New Story uh, in, in oh my gosh, Nacajuca, Mexico. And uh, we were able to 3D print 500 square foot homes for a community in need. These are all uh, inhabited by members of that community. And each of the homes, there are nine of them, were printed in 24 hours. Only the walls, not the finishing. 
Uh, interestingly, these structures were able to withstand a 7.0 magnitude earthquake um, without visible damage. Next slide. And then last but not least, I'll conclude on a project that we completed almost a year ago now. Uh, this is the Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog, which is a research analog and environment at the Johnson Space Center. We were awarded a contract via Jacobs to demonstrate that a analog habitat could be printed using, using additive manufacturing technologies. And so that's what we did. It was not intended to simulate or verify any of the kind of structural or environmental issues having to do with uh, design and, and construction of a Mars habitat. Essentially, this uh, is a is a unpressurized uh, structure that we uh, 3D printed within an enclosed environment, within a conditioned environment already. And the analog experiments will uh, hopefully be kicking off in the new year. Uh, four crew members are anticipated to live within this structure. Next slide, please. Uh, are anticipated to, uh, to uh, be in this structure for an entire year, which I believe is the longest analog mission NASA has planned to date. Here's a rendering showing our Vulcan construction system within building 220. Next slide, please. And here's a, an image of our Vulcan gantry. We refer to our gantry style printer as uh, the Vulcan and our material handling system is known as magma and our material that we print is lava crete. So we have a volcano theme that, we're, that we work with. Uh, you'll notice that the, our material is red, which is not what it is traditionally uh, when we do our residential builds. But in this case, we happen to dye it red just to be a little bit more Mars-like. It was purely aesthetic. Next slide. So this very, very uh, laggy video is showing construction of the walls for the Chapia analog. Um, there, I'll tell you a little bit about our wall system and how this structure was built. Uh, so there is steel in the walls and uh, we also incorporate insulation within our residential projects and our traditional construction projects because this was inside of a conditioned building Already, we didn't incorporate insulation, but we did 3D print the roof. And we did that similarly to the way that our demonstration at Pendleton happened, which is in panels and segments that were then craned into place using uh, the overhead crane at Johnson Space Center. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the key initiatives for this analog include uh, evaluating whether we can actually, uh, ev evaluating advanced food systems for long duration missions. Uh, Grace Douglas is the PI for the Chapia Research Project and that is her primary area of, of, of emphasis. Uh, and the analog and the experiment will be looking at crew health and measures uh, and how we can measure and qualify crew health and performance over the long term for a one year mission. And hopefully all of this will be, uh, will be sort of incorporated and synthesized into long duration mission standards for future missions to Mars and the moon. Next slide, please. Here's the general layout of the Chapia analog. On the far left, we have crew quarters. Towards the center, we have a kitchen area as well as bedroom area. And then uh, on the far right, we have a working area. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, these were our renderings and our depiction of what the interior might look like. I regret to report that the interior does not look like this in, a, in reality. Next slide, please. And uh, our vision of the crew quarters. Next slide, please. I have a bit of video here to show you what it looks like when our Vulcan is actually printing structures. Um, it's a little bit laggy, but in any event, the Vulcan, as I mentioned, is a gantry style printer. It prints a mortar-based cement. Uh, we have a front end user interface that our construction operators use to identify and know when certain interventions need to be made with in the print. So when uh, sills, windows, doors, et cetera, and other kinds of elements need to be incorporated, you'll notice that uh, the printer operates on Y rails. So it moves back and forth on the rails. And then the X beam as well as the towers are such that they can be uh, packed and assembled on site and they all fit within a shipping container. Uh, 
And that's the end of the video. Thank you so much.